Good evening, everyone. Welcome to a very, very special edition of The Readout, live from the Flying Saucer Draft Emporium in Fort Worth, Texas. We are now just two weeks away from midterm elections, and the stakes could not be higher for the Lone Star State, where everything, everything from school board elections to the race for governor is dominated by the struggle to define what America is and who America stands for. Texas is arguably the center of the U.S. culture wars, the red state that might be getting a little less red here and there, where the consequences for this year's elections are at a fever pitch. So just remember, this is where the high-stakes abortion conversation that we're all having right now began. When Texas passed its bounty hunter abortion ban, even before the Supreme Court reversed Roe v. Wade. Voting in Texas is so restricted, and anti-voter laws so effective, folks have dubbed it Jim Crow 2.0. More books have been banned from school libraries in this state than any other state. And this beautiful state is unfortunately home to more mass shootings than any other, including the Uvalde massacre, the second deadliest school shooting ever in the United States. On immigration, Texas is also front and center. The state shares a 1,250 mile border with Mexico, from which many desperate immigrants attempt, desperate migrants attempt to cross into the U.S. each year. Though let's just not forget that most Mexican-Americans did not cross the border, the border crossed them. They were already here before this was a U.S. state. Also, the state is at the center of the demographic changes that are awaiting the whole country. Four in 10 Texans are Latino, and they are the largest population group here, though not yet the largest voter group. Bottom line, Texas is a microcosm of American politics right now. Though this is not the only state where election action is taking place this week. Statewide candidate debates are taking place tonight in Pennsylvania and Colorado. There was a gubernatorial debate last night in Florida, where we recently learned that the governor there partnered with the Texas governor here to trick some Venezuelan migrants into getting on flights to Massachusetts. Now, I could go on, but I'm not. Instead, I'm going to stop talking and turn to the man who is vying to become the new governor of this state, sitting beside me here with a very big crowd of fans behind him is the person who's doing everything in his power to challenge a Republican uh, vision for a state better or Democratic tech, Democratic governor, gubernatorial candidate. How are you? I'm doing great. Welcome to Fort Worth. Thank you. Welcome to the home of Opal Lee, yes. the godmother yes. of Jim Duke. Yes. To Deborah Peoples, the next county judge of Tarrant County, and so many amazing folks, Democrats, Republicans, independents alike who want to see something great for Texas, and they're going to vote for it on November 8th. You know what? And I just met Opa Lee. Um, she is epic, and uh, I, I am excited to talk to her later. we got to get to know her later, but that is amazing. I do want to start with you. I was on with Nicole Wallace earlier. I'm going to jump right into it. And we had a conversation um, about guns. And um, it, it's a difficult issue to tackle because there, on the one hand, are these awful tragedies like what happened in Uvalde. And it's, you can't get it out of your mind. You can't stop thinking about those moms and dads and those little kids. And then you've got people who are really passionate about gun ownership. They're really passionate about not having any restrictions to gun ownership whatsoever, no matter how many massacres. How do you talk to that latter group who say, I like Beto, he seems like a good guy, but I don't want him to be governor because he's gonna take my guns. I remind them that today marks 22 weeks since we lost those 19 children and their two teachers in Uvalde, Texas. It's been 22 weeks and our governor, Greg Abbott, has literally not done a thing to make it any less likely that any other child in any other part of the state meets the same fate as those 19 kids. And then I listen to them. I listen to my fellow Texans, Republicans, gun owners, Democrats, independents. Here's what we can agree on. At a minimum, let's raise the age of purchase for an AR-15 to 21. That would purchase at least three more years for some kind of intervention. Yeah. A red flag law that would allow law enforcement to intervene if that person already has a firearm and they're threatening to use it against somebody else or a universal background check, which just simply means if you're gonna buy a gun in Texas, we're gonna do some due diligence to make sure you won't use that weapon against yourself yeah. or against somebody else. We have five of the worst mass shootings in US history just in the last five years. There's no one in the state who's okay with that, but we're gonna need to have a change in the governor's office to have someone who will actually do something about you it. You know, the thing is they haven't done nothing, the Republicans. I mean, th this is one of the most shocking stories uh, this week, and there's lots of shocking stories like every day. Um, the idea that kids, that families in Texas who have children in public school are being given DNA kits so that, God forbid, a mass shooting happen in their school, they can identify what's left of their child. Because we both know what an AR-15 does to a human body. It, it, you can't hunt with it, you'd get nothing, right? Mush. That's right. That's um, right. And it does the same thing to a human, and God forbid, a child. 
it, it is shocking, I think, for a lot of Americans when they think even a state like Florida raised the age to 21. Um, when you think about the fact that to get a handgun, you have to fill out a lot of paperwork. You have to go and get a background check and get fingerprinted. So that the, But to get an AR-15, you can literally just go to a pawn shop and buy one with nothing. That's right. So how do you, I mean, I, I, what would you do? Let's say you're governor, you're sworn in. What would you do to immediately make that kind of a change? How could you do it? I'm going to bring everyone around the table. That's not just Democratic legislators, but Republicans as well. And I'm going to find that common ground that I have been hearing about as I travel literally every part of this state. And look, we're not going to agree on, on everything. But those three ideas that I started with, of raising the age of a red flag law, of a universal background check, those measures will save lives. You mentioned Florida. It took that Republican governor and Republican legislature 23 days after Marjorie Stoneman Douglas to raise the age to 21. Since then, mass shootings are down more than 80% in that state. Those kind of things work. And I have yet to find the Republican or the gun owner who argues the other side of that issue. They say, you know what? I can get behind raising yeah. to 21 or a universal background check or doing a little bit of due diligence. Here's another thing that Abbott has done. Besides sending the DNA test kits to schools for parents to identify their kids after they've been shot, he's also weakened our gun laws further to allow anyone to carry a gun in public without a background check, without any vetting or any training whatsoever. We used to have a program called License to Carry that allowed law enforcement to do a little bit of due diligence before you could carry a gun in public. 38,000 times over the last six years, they said, hey, this person is just too dangerous to carry that gun. They're going to use it against their spouse or their girlfriend, or perhaps against some kids in schools. Now all 38,000 of them are free to carry those guns in public, and none of us are the safer or the wiser for it. That is why gun violence and homicides have increased 50% in this state since Greg Abbott has been governor, why we lead the nation in school shootings, yeah. and why gun violence is the leading cause of death for children and teenagers. Those kids, they don't get a vote in this election right. except through the actions we take. Their lives are literally on the ballot. That's why we got to vote and make sure that we win on November 8th. You know, a lot of uh, newspapers here in this, the great state of Texas have endorsed you, but the Dallas Morning News endorsed, endorsed your opponent, endorsed the incumbent, uh, Greg Abbott. And the reason that they gave was he's good for business. But I look at some of the statistics, and I love Texas. I think Texas is beautiful. The weather is great. It can be a little 10 degrees warmer. I always like to be warm. I'm a tropical girl. But it's a great state. But when I think about it as an outsider looking in, this state, as you said, it leads the world in gun massacres, not just the country, but the, the whole world. It's number one in rapes, unfortunately. And the governor said he said he was going to end rape. I don't think he's done that. It hasn't happened no. yet. Um, and then you've got the abortion issue. If you have a state that's the number one state statistically you're most likely to be raped. And then you also have a restrictive abortion law that says that, God forbid that happened to you, you have to leave the state and you might actually still get prosecuted. You can go to prison for trying to get an abortion. That's the other issue that is this state leads on. It, I talked to someone today, a young woman who said, you know what, it bothers me. It's the thing that bothers her the most, but thought it was, it's done. It can't be fixed. That can't be changed. Can it be changed? All of these things can be changed. And just on this issue of business, there's no one who's been worse for the Texas economy than Greg Abbott. Our property taxes, for example, have gone up $20 billion over the last eight years. It's a 40% increase. Our electricity bills, when Governor Abbott could not keep the power on for the people of Texas in the energy capital of the world, when the temperature dropped last winter, have gone up 45 bucks on average per rate payer. He's the single greatest driver of inflation in the state of Texas. Our minimum wage is still $7.25 an hour, 13 years after it was set. And then you have these attacks on our fellow Texans against transgender Texans or their parents who are being accused of child abuse against members of the LGBTQ community. They're proposing a don't say gay bill next legislative session. And in this state, no woman is now able to make her own decisions about her own body. That abortion ban is the most extreme in America. It begins at conception. And as you mentioned, there's no exception for incest, nor is there one for rape. And in Texas, the rapist could actually sue the family of his victim if they assist her in getting an abortion and collect a $10,000 bounty. This is how extreme it is. And that's why a majority of Texans, including a majority of Republicans, yeah. disagree with Abbott's extreme abortion ban. It's another reason that we have to win. I mean, most importantly for the women of this state, we're at the epicenter of a maternal mortality crisis that is three times as deadly for black women. When you have foreclosed opportunities to seek reproductive health care, you have condemned women to suffering and to unnecessary death. 
So for all of those reasons, we have got to change this. But here's the thing. 50 years ago, abortion was just as illegal in Texas as it is today. But young Texas women prevailed upon an all-male United States Supreme Court one Roe versus Wade, that stood the test of time for 50 years. If they won it 50 years ago, I believe Texas women are going to win it back in yeah. February, in, in November 8th of 2022. So, you, people love you here. Um, if you poll on these issues, it's clear. A majority of Texans disagree with the abortion ban. A majority of Texans want reasonable gun reform. Uh, a majority of Texans don't want to like ban history from schools. Texas, you know, they're good, good folks. People are not in a majority wanting these things. But in order for you to win, you have to get past really restrictive voting laws. I mean, these are the worst in the country, honestly. Um, will people be able to get their votes for you to count? We've already seen rejections of absentee ballots cast by Asian American, African American, and Latino voters here rejected at a much higher rate than white voters. The machinery is already working. There is a Reuters poll that's showing you closing the gap, closing what was the real clear politics average gap. Um, but can enough of your voters actually get to cast ballots for you to be able to prevail? The answer is yes. It's not going to be easy. Um, this is the most voter suppressed state in the union. Harder to cast a ballot or to get your name on the rolls to be registered to vote yeah. than anywhere else in America. The answer to that is all of us literally knocking on the doors of those people who are the targets of suppression and intimidation. Our campaign has over 95,000 volunteers who are doing the hard work of meeting voters where they're at and bringing them in. And, and the beautiful, poetic, political justice of all of this is that the very people who were intentionally drawn out of this democracy are being brought in by their fellow Texans to form the margin of victory on the night of November 8th. So let